I'm standing on the spot where the dog got loose from its leash, and I have my photographer standing at the gate where the sheriff's deputy walked in, just to give you an idea of the distance between the dog and the gate. Cada Semana Santa hay un gran montón de tráfico en la frontera entre Ojinaga, México, y aquí en Presidio, en los Estados Unidos. We knew at least two emails were lost here at the Odessa Police Department, so we sent seven Freedom of Information requests to find out how many emails were sent by CPS versus how many were actually received. We were surprised to learn that not all those numbers added up. With homes and schools expanding closer and closer to oil and gas infrastructure, it's no longer just about physically protecting that dangerous equipment, it's also about protecting it from cyber attacks. We've learned that the Ector County Sheriff's deputy who has been shot was transported to the hospital alive and well, although we don't know his current condition. We're choosing not to release the name right now. The Sheriff's Department has asked that we give families some time before we do so. We have a video that uh, appears to have you with with another woman in, inside an ambulance. Is it true that you turned in your resignation? I'm not sure what's going on. Are you still a police officer? I'm not sure what's going on. I'm why did you upstairs? Why did you turn off the audio recordings? I don't know what you're talking about. Are you still a police officer? I'm go upstairs, boss. Upstairs. Out here in West Odessa, take a look. You have houses literally across the street from what will be the site of a concrete mixing plant. Now, it's this white sign that has residents so concerned. Put up by the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, SWAT team surrounded it. They thought he was inside this building. They even kicked down the door and they sent in tear gas canisters to try and get him out. Take a look at this. You can see a tear gas canister sitting here on the ground. I don't want to touch it because you can still feel and smell uh, the smoke, the remnants of where that tear gas was. It really was a team effort here last night, in addition to what the general here calls heroic efforts by first responders. The Rio Grande behind me, this arroyo is one of the spots where illegal immigrants cross the border, but they're dealing with a harsh landscape, and in the middle of the day, triple-digit heat is one of the many dangers. Priority one cases are the most dangerous CPS deals um, with. We've got to move all of these off my workload today. In the case of baby Jeremiah, affidavits reveal CPS knew about a violent incident and hospitalization 12 days before his death. So we asked police about it in a February 28th press conference. We were never made aware uh, of the injury to the child until the 27th, the day the child died when we were doing our interviews. But CPS did contact Odessa police. The problem is it was via email an email that was never read. We kept asking OPD about those emails and as late as March 3rd, they had no record of the case. But two days later, after continued questioning from CBS 7, police say they had received the email after all, but hadn't seen it because it was caught in a spam filter. Could there be any other emails out there caught in spam folders like this case? I couldn't answer that. You know, we, we know that the emails go out, but we have no indication if they're caught up in a spam folder. We generate those emails and, um, and hope that those jurisdictions uh, have taken the precautions to be sure that they go into the regular email. We knew at least two emails were lost here at the Odessa Police Department, so we sent seven Freedom of Information requests to find out how many emails were sent by CPS versus how many were actually received. We were surprised to learn that not all those numbers added up. Two agencies, the Odessa Police Department and the Howard County Sheriff's Office, say they do follow up on cases but keep no record of the receipt of those emails. CPS data shows Midland Police were sent 125 notifications of Priority One cases in 2013, but Midland Police say there were far more. The Midland County Sheriff's Office logged 49 cases last year, Big Spring 56, yet CPS said its notification system sent out no notifications. We gave CPS a chance to double check. They say they still fax to some agencies. They sent us a second set of numbers late today that still don't add up. The data is not as clear as we thought it would be, so we showed it to an expert, former CPS investigator and Houston nonprofit director Dr. Catherine Berea. The fact that there are, are so many discrepancies is, is cause for alarm and I think cause for the Department of Family and Protective Services to take immediate action to look at that notification system 
and, and figure out what is causing the discrepancy. We also shared what we learned with State Representative-elect Brooks Landgraf. He said, quote, there is clearly room for improvement at CPS. When I take office, I will work to make CPS and other state agencies more efficient and effective. What we found also caught the attention of a state senator. If you think maybe the system should be stopped and reevaluated. If there's something wrong with the system, it should be fixed. A child died, and so it has to be fixed. And so, yes, we must ask what went wrong and what needs to be done to fix it. Clearly, it's not the law. It's the mechanism, and it must be fixed. Do you think that the email system has any flaws? Well, you know, in this case, I know that emails go out from our, our statewide intake, and we have a record of that. And I believe that the system um, is certainly better than the old system where we faxed reports. We believe that this system is far superior to what we've had in the past. Since our inquiry, OPD began logging emails and now sits down with the local CPS office weekly. Any ideas to why that wasn't happening before here? I, I really couldn't speak to that. This is just an opportunity to be more thorough and to have those regular face-to-face -face meetings so that none of the information slips through the crack for any kind of reason. It's an opportunity that comes only after baby Jeremiah fell through the cracks. What do you think could help here? Phone interaction instead of emailing. That was a key deal. If they would have, if the caseworker, if the caseworker and OPD would have got together, if they would have had phone interaction, I think that would have helped. If those emails had been received by OPD or even if the caseworker had made a call to OPD, do you think this baby might still be alive? I don't know that we have any way of knowing that. I know that there's not a one of us who wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't give our right arm for that baby to be alive, that we don't wish that this had turned out differently. I know those officers do. I know that my staff do. I do. But I think that um, it's difficult to, to look back and to go, oh, if I had done this, it, it would have changed the situation. I don't think that we know. If there were a different system, do you think your grandson might still be alive? Yes. We went to Salvador Becerra's home, but he didn't come out. Today, he walked right into OPD for his administrative hearing. No friends, family, or attorneys beside him. No statements can be made. Yeah. Is it true that you turned in your resignation? I'm not sure what's going on. Are you still a police officer? I'm not sure what's going on. Why did you upstairs. Why'd you turn off the audio recordings? I don't know what you're talking about. Are you still a police officer? Go upstairs, boss. Upstairs. The allegations that brought him to the professional standards office are disturbing. Becerra faces felony improper sexual activity charges after investigation revealed he allegedly touched the breasts of at least three women during traffic stops. Becerra asked the women questions like, what size are your breasts? And we are making exceptions, aren't we? In an attempt to get them out of their stop. Becerra walked out of today's meeting, sunglasses Just on. Are any Just tell us, are, are any of the allegations true? It's a yes or no question. Are any of the allegations true? With nothing to say. To the women who came forward with these allegations. Do you have anything to say? Will you still be a police officer? It's very quiet here, it's real safe. I enjoy it. Laurie Holman is one gate and dirt road from a spot on the Rio Grande River where people chance crossing. I call it my sidewalk to Mexico. Because <laughs> normally there's not even water. Many pay mules or coyotes to bring them across. Last week, Holman saw a man and his two young daughters alone on the American side in the dark of night likely waiting for a paid escort that never came. It's hard over there, so they'll risk anything to, to better their lives. Well, your first instinct is to pick them up, pick up those little girls, bring them back. I said, do you have water? Do you have food? Um, are y'all okay? So I checked on them and checked on them, worrying about them. 
Finally, I said, guys, I can't leave you out here. And they came and got him. There wasn't any other choice but to do that. The Rio Grande behind me, this arroyo is one of the spots where illegal immigrants cross the border, but they're dealing with a harsh landscape. And in the middle of the day, triple digit heat is one of the many dangers. There's a lack of water. When they start crossing, they cross over the mountains, over, over that way. And it is rough and rugged, rattlesnakes um, in the night, and it's just real rough. Holman is leery of what increased patrol might mean for the border. Here, it's pretty quiet, very, I don't see a whole lot of it. I don't know if it'll make things better or if it will cause more harm than good. With an eye on Presidio County, Matt Rist, CBS 7 News.